Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Kelly Seacat. My name is Donna Comwell, and we are your hosts of Scratch Space. Scratch Space is a virtual forum hosted by the Lucas Artist Residency Program at Montovo Arts Center, which is located on the ancestral lands of the Ohlone people. In this space, we're bringing together visual artists, scholars, composers, activists, writers, and others to explore what kinds of radical imaginaries can unfold in this moment of pandemic, racial reckoning, economic uncertainty, civil unrest, and environmental crisis. We're interested in how do we think about what is possible? How can we use our imaginations to build a better present and future? And how can we retool and create better and more equitable models for living and working together? So who are we going to be speaking with today, Kelly? So today we're going to be talking with three incredible artists and cultural producers who I feel fortunate to have joining us. Janet Owen Driggs is a scholar, curator, and professor at Cypress College, where she's also the director of the Cypress Art Gallery, College Art Gallery. I first met Janice, Janet as an artist collaborating with her husband as Owen Driggs. Dorit Sippis is an artist, educator, and mediator, and founder of People's Lab. I first had the opportunity to work with Dorit on an installation as part of Consider This, the final exhibition of LACMA Lab at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. And we're also joined by Gregory Sale, an artist, educator, and justice reform advocate from Arizona. I had the opportunity to know Gregory long before I knew where life would actually lead me. And Gregory was the first person I ever recall that I heard saying, contemporary art was a vehicle to change the world. That caught my attention. So for today, with these three and Donna, we're going to be investigating whiteness, sharing our own experiences as we identify our roles in social justice work and the work of anti-racism. Thank you, Kelly. I'm, I'm really excited for this conversation. Um, just to let our viewers know that links to our guest full bios have been posted in the chat. Um, I'd like to take a moment just to thank our producer Nathan Sanon for being with us today. Um, there's a lot to talk, ab talk about, so I'll disappear shortly, and then Kelly, Dorit, Janet, and Gregory will talk for about 45 minutes or 50 minutes, and then I'll return to field questions from you, our audience. So, you know, please post your questions and comments in the chat. Um, and thank you, Kelly, and I will see you soon. I'll see you shortly. <clears throat> so I'll let our panelists arrive. And I just, hello, Janet. Hello, Gregory. Hello, Dorit. I wanna thank you all again for joining me today. <clears throat> I sat down reviewing my notes and I started to type in some additional notes for myself and my computer was typing in Greek. And I thought it was maybe symbolic of the conversation we're going to have. Um, it was June 30th of this year when Janet and Gregory and I had the opportunity to join about 50 of our colleagues um, on Zoom our new sort of public global square for the pilot project of People's Lab, Identity, Race, and Whiteness, How Racism Lives Within Us, it was designed by Dorit Sipis. It was designed for white people to really take on kind of the, the tombs of white supremacy and, and really look at how we can start to transform the ideas of whiteness, unpack it. So my hope is today we can work on some of that and share some of our experiences and the way we're thinking about our current roles in the work of creating systemic change. I wanna ask Dorit if you would start us with a grounding exercise. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, grounding. So I just to remind um, 
each of us that we are um, we are sharing a public forum, um, public, and yet we are each in our private spaces. And uh, I want to remind us that's not unlike the fact that we are all every second of our lives in even more private spaces, and that is our interiorities, our bodies, our sense of self from within. We carry that into every public context um, that we experience. So we are both private and public all the time. And Zoom is really personifying that for us. But I'd like us to just honor where we each are at within our own um, deeply private selves and ground. Just allow your eyes to close for a moment and just take one deep breath in and release it on your exhale and allow yourself to take another deep breath in and as you inhale recognizing all the points of contact that your body is making with your chair and as you exhale releasing any tension through your exhale through the points of contact to deepen your connection to the support beneath you, the chair you're sitting in, supported by gravity, just for you. So that is part of our, what we will take into our collective forum and just honor yourself, your own experience, your emotions, your memories, even your judgments, whatever goes through you. Take one more breath in and on the exhale, allow your eyes to open gently. And just taking in the public forum again. Welcome. Thank you, Dorit. It's a nice way for us to begin. Nice way for us to arrive here. So we put together some slides and because each of you in my mind is such a significant cultural producer um, and with long and, and very integrity filled commitment to equity and social justice in your work, I thought it was the thing for us to do is to let each of you introduce yourself, share your work, and maybe share some of your own experiences, if we can, pre-COVID, if we can even remember that moment of confronting kind of whiteness in your work. And I guess, Janet, if you're willing, I'd like to start with you. I'm going to pull up the screen. Always a little delay. All right. Hello, Janet Owen Driggs. You're on mute. Happens. Hello, hello, hello. Gregory, Dorit, Donna, Nathan, and everyone in the audience. Um, it's my pleasure today to be here to discuss this topic, and I am so thrilled that we are able to discuss this topic which has not really been spoken of so directly in my experience um, in this kind of cultural forum on a kind of general way this is a conversation so many of us are having and that we need to be having right now um, i can't actually see the image i'm wanting to show you and talk about on my screen, there it is. So this this painting is the one I, I wanted to show to you. It's the only the only artwork I'm gonna share, and it's by probably the most famous painter of the 19th century in his day. Um, he was uh, Degas and Monet. Both said that the world would remember William Adolphe Bougereau as a great painter in the year 2000, but not then. So. We don't tend to know about him now, but he was immensely famous and influential, neoclassical 
artist in the late 19th century, so contemporary with the Impressionists. This is an artwork I show many of my students, um, and I used to show it primarily as an example of academic art, the, the kind of values um, and tropes that the avant, the modern avant-garde were rejecting and kicking against. It's very smooth, illusionistic surface. And the more frequently I discuss this painting with my, my students, and I teach at a community college, I teach art history, I'm responsible for teaching 50,000 years of Western culture as a Western specialist. And the more we discussed this, the more I realized there was something that we weren't addressing. Remember, well over 50% of the students in my classroom are usually Latinx students. Um, we weren't discussing the incredible whiteness of this painting. Now, it presents the epitome of the neoclassical idea of female beauty, the female de demeanor. She's very innocently coy, unashamedly on full display. My students had no problem understanding her as a product of the male gaze. Um, her relationship to this unattainable beauty ideal that so many of my students struggle with. But the whiteness was rarely noticed. And she is pearlescent. Um, everyone else in the picture is less white. Everyone else in the picture is heralding her arrival, acknowledging her superiority as the goddess of beauty. She's the star of the show. Above all, this painting is a pay-on to the superiority of whiteness. Um, increasingly, that became something that I would talk with my students about in the classroom. Um, and why, why was it, why is it important to recognize this in an, you know, an old painting? Who cares about Bougereau anymore? Well, because the painting is an example of the way in which the lies of white supremacy have been made seductive in Western culture. This, I would say, is a white supremacist's wet dream. Um, it speaks to the glamorization of white supremacy in 19th century art, but more importantly, the near invisibility of her blinding whiteness also tells us that the valorization and the privileges of whiteness are still so normalized that they are invisible particularly to white people. Um, they clutch and constrain our ideas, our values, our actions, and our imaginations. So my discipline is a product of white supremacist thinking from its birth. It's being structured to perpetuate the conviction that white European Christian capitalist culture represents the pinnacle of civilization and that's what we see here it thus places other cultures other races other ethnicities on a sliding scale from rude to savage um, the hard truth is of course that racial equity can't be um, can't be achieved just by you know including in my classes more work by artists of color um, we need to dig deep to understand how we have been seduced um, by the lies of white supremacy, how we come to, how we concur, how we collude with this idea that whiteness is best. Um, it's not just in the shape of the clan or the Proud Boys. It's in the DNA of our institutions, our disciplines, our cherished cultural objects, the assumptions and values that kind of we swim in um, as a society. Um, and it's in the DNA of our imagining as well. Um, so as a teacher, I feel it's my challenge to identify and unpack the meaning making system that we see in a painting like the, the Birth of Venus here. Um, with my students and my colleagues. But as a human, uh, my challenge is to unpack it in myself, to understand, to identify in my paradigmatic DNA, um, 
this inherited notion of unspoken assumptions, ideas and values that we all swim in and which some of us benefit from. So there's Bougereau. Thank you, Janet. All right, Gregory, I'm going to go on to you. And maybe we're going to start with an earlier project you did in 2011. And I know knowing you, it was much longer than 2011. <laughs> it was maybe 10 years in development. Uh, here I'm sitting with Sheriff Joe Arpaio. Um, uh, he's no longer the sheriff, but he's a kind of infamous Arizona figure who I would imagine many people know. Um, uh, sheriff 24 years in Maricopa County, which I sort of uh, I live in Arizona. I, I also kind of based in Phoenix and based a little bit in LA. Um, but um, uh, in 2011, I did this project, It's Not Just Black and White. Uh, I had spent a year and a half getting my first meeting with Sheriff Joe. Uh, he, um, you know, reinstated or, or created a chain gang for men, women, and juveniles in Arizona. He put um, men, everyone back in black and white striped uniforms, he put men in pink underwear, he created a, um, a tent city jail in the desert. Um, and he was using art and visual imagery to uh, sort of grow his political power to do his version of criminal justice work. Um, and so I, I organized this uh, installation where men who had been working within his jail came into the museum in their black and white uniforms and painted black and white stripes on the museum walls is a backdrop of three months of programs. Sheriff Joe was part of one, Angela Davis was part of another one. Um, but that first meeting with Sheriff Joe, he, you know, he said to me, um, hey, you have family from the Shenandoah Valley. I have family from Shenandoah Valley. What he was saying was that they had done a background check on me that went back to my grandparents and uh, back to Virginia. And I will say that in my individual analysis, um, one of the lines in that family tree uh, is plantation owners. And I can't imagine a way which slavery was not part of that in early slaves there. And so that's something to grapple with, right? Now there's a separation. My grandfather was born out of wedlock. He was illegitimate. He was distanced from the family, but I continue to carry that name. Um, but as we are all these complex beings, my mother, Italian American, my father called my mother a WAP without papers, right? With her family came over without papers. Does that position me to understand undocumented workers today? It does not, but at least opens a door for me to think about it. And when we think about things like race, I don't, it, for me, it goes out to a broader discussion of discrimination and shame. I grew up as a queer boy in the South. I got called faggot all the time. I could beat up and I learned to beat back and I'm a good fighter. And um, uh, 25 years ago, I had my partner, my first husband died of AIDS. I have been there on the line. I've been there on a lot of lines. From that, I have learned a sort of a, a way of sort of discovering myself through art and uh, self identity experience, queer activism, AIDS awareness, that was all in the early work that's led to the practice I've developed in part of unpacking these pieces. Let's go to the next image. And I, I'm not gonna talk about it long, but I just wanted to throw those things out. Right, thank you. The, it, this next image jumps to this project that's sort of in its afterlife now. We just did a film, it's called Future Ideas at Alcatraz. Like another mini, mini, multiple year project um, about individuals with conviction histories and their identities and their voices and holding, uh, holding space uh, for stories of trauma, transformation and resilience on Alcatraz, a year long project. Um, and it's really about, uh, I think about my practice now almost as a, um, a member of a movement. Um, a, a contributor to a movement. So we pull out of these ideas of this notion of artist as author, our solo author, but somebody who contributes to a movement. Um, who, what I bring is a sort of aesthetic uh, expertise, some facilitations, and other people bring other expertises to our collective. 
maybe that's all I'll say. Thank you. Thank you, Gregory. We'll go on to you, Dorit. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Janet and Gregory. Fascinating what you shared. Um, I'm showing this image. Uh, it's a production still from a project that I began after just, just after 9-11. And I, I decided to show it as an example of something in my art practice um, because Kelly Seacat uh, worked on this project with me when it was um, installed at LACMA in 2006. Um, this, this production still um, just shows um, two key components of the project. You see a Newsweek uh, magazine cover uh, at the corner on the table. And that is a cover that I, I, I saw and noticed and um, was stunned by um, in April of uh, 2001. Um, and it shows uh, two young women uh, uh, one uh, Israeli Jew and one Palestinian um, Arab, uh, both who died in a when the Palestinian woman detonated herself in a marketplace in uh, Jerusalem. And uh, what stunned me was that they both look like my family, and uh, that you certainly can don't know who is um, Palestinian, who is Jewish. And it alerted me to uh, a complexity of identity um, that doesn't, doesn't fit into identity. Our, 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 our stratification system in America is quite narrow uh, in how it defines um, identity. Uh, but within, um, I am, I've never identified as a white person, but I've identified as a multi-ethnic Semitic Jew um, and uh, born in, in Israel. And uh, I recognize um, that um, even without identifying as white, I carry extraordinary privilege because I appear white. And that whiteness is a very complex notion. We do not understand it at all. And that there are many ethnicities and identities that don't neatly and clearly fit into the categories that we've allowed ourselves. And yet the term privilege around whiteness needs to be explored as the weaponization of whiteness that is carried by those of us who are not necessarily white as well. Um, so I show this to you um, just to give you a sense of um, a project. I won't talk more about it. It's quite complex. It took seven years to create, but I'll go into the next slide. And the next slide um, is just a tool I developed um, about a dozen years ago when uh, I began studying conflict and became a professional mediator. Uh, under the rubric of being an artist. And I did that um, specifically because my work as an artist, which has always questioned identity in and social relations, uh, the more I um, entered into um, deeper questions with actual people, living people in living communities, the more I encountered conflict as a uh, critical, um, core to a lot of engagement that tried to uh, understand difference and actually tried to understand diversity and didn't understand difference. And um, I started to develop, uh, I, 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 I went and studied conflict as I shared and I became a professional mediator. I de I've developed dozens and dozens of uh, teaching tools and training tools and consulting tools on trying to unpack identity. And in this tool, um, on, on, on the left hand side, you see um, a typical seven um, categories of identity, um, diversity identity, that we often um, talk about in identity politics. It includes class, race, gender, sexuality, ethnicity, ability, uh, ability physical and mental. I, um, on the right, you see um, seven other categories. 
that I would um, term belong to the notion of our differences, which make each of us uh, unique, uh, different, as well as connected humanly. And I've worked with these seven categories for about 30, 40 years now um, that fill, uh, they're quite broad, myth, memory, history, fantasy, dream, family, desire. And in this tool, this, this instant, I'm using it for a class of 40 students at a Temple University in Los Angeles. I'm asking each student to choose a category of diversity that they have some uh, identification with or some question with or some compulsion around and to connect it with um, a term on in the right column, some other aspect of identity that they also feel compelled by, that they um, are connected to and have a, a relationship and consciousness to. And as each um, person in the class named um, a relationship, I drew a line and I said, this is the portrait of this class. Um, and then I asked each student to tell a story of the connection between the two words that they brought together to complicate what we understand of identity. So this is just to say that I've been working on, on, on these questions of, of identity and difference for a very, very long time. And it brings us into this question, of course, that we're sharing today of what is whiteness. Thank you. Thank you, Dari. So I'm gonna stop sharing the screen. I'm gonna bring you all back. And I guess I want to start well, you know, in this moment of coronavirus, in this moment of being sort of held at home and sheltering in place, you know, I experienced first in March a great relief that the world was going to just slow down a little bit. I could have some time with my kids, some time with my family, some time at home. And, um, you know, we were starting to get restless in May and we came to the moment of George Floyd which for me was yet again another huge kind of reveal in my life of just the levels and depths of racism and white supremacy um, in the country. It was, it was a horror to watch, to see. And I received a phone call from a dear friend and one of our artists on Monday morning the 26th. And I was asked to do a couple of things. And one was, you know, to do everything I could to, to fight against this, like her life depended on it. And the other was to talk to white people because white people needed to pick up the slack and do the work or whatever that meant. And so I looked at my various communities and, and who was in them and, and it's really been you know, I'm grateful, my dear colleagues at Montalvo who've risen to the occasion of having these conversations, really reflecting on ourselves. Um, in that, I'm quite grateful. I look to friend groups, I look to family groups, and I found a lot of people wanting to pull away, not have these conversations for various reasons. And all of that starts to sort of break your heart um, because in my mind, this is the work now for, for the duration. We need to figure out this problem. And if there are these systemic racist systems, we it's our job to unearth them, unpack them, and collapse them. So when I got the email invitation to join the People's Lab um, pilot, I was delighted. I was, you know, course it was to read. I was thrilled. And I just want you to, read, to share a little bit about how kind of you moved in this direction. You moved so quickly. We were meeting by the 30th of June and there were over 50 people in that session with us. And I think we probably all felt the same sort of relief that somebody was making this kind of space. Now, Kelly, um... I'm, uh, <clears throat> I, I, I came to it um, through George Floyd. Um, as I shared, I've been, I've, been, I've been doing work on, on identity and difference for a very, very long time, including race issues. 
but it was the moment of, of watching on the screen um, this man murdered in front of my eyes um, that shook me to my core. And of course we were in a moment of COVID so that I was very open and vulnerable to my core as most of us were. And I think that's why we have this, this crack in our collective culture to even ask the question of what is whiteness where we haven't been able to do it before. And I watched that video and I, uh, I, was, I, 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 I knew the block. I'd lived near that neighborhood for 16 years when I lived in Minneapolis. And I worked with a lot of the youth in that neighborhood um, through a program I created called Culture Club, a collaborative. And when I heard the people around the officer speak up, and they were uh, the black residents, community members, and their voices remained at a very even tone like mine is now, pleading with the officer to get off the man's neck. But their voices never rose to in, 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 in volume. And, and, and I, it immediately sparked me on a visceral level. And I felt myself enter the screen of my of my monitor, and 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 move up from amongst those um, community members to push my body into the body of the white cop, to shove him off the man's neck. And at that moment, it I I I I woke with an epiphany. Oh my God! I have the privilege of imagining myself pushing against this white man's body where all of these black people standing around this man whom they know being murdered can't. And it just broke all my boundaries, all my thresholds. My anger was so alive. And I said, I have got to just take all my tools and redirect them now towards some kind of a public forum on identity, race, and whiteness. And that's what I did um, through June. I developed it. I uh, created new tools. I read a ton of material, reread a ton of material, um, thought very carefully about the Zoom format in engaging this level of vulnerable discourse and how to um, guide people to enter through this public veil of publicness on Zoom and into themselves. That was the beginning of um, the People's Lab session. That's great. I wanna open it up to both Janet and Gregory and see if there's anything you'd like to share from either from that session or in reflection of, of that time that you've taken with you and considered. You know, for me, you know, just reviewing my notes and thinking a little bit about it, there was something that Dorit was very clear, this isn't necessarily the time for reaction, for action, but a real deep reflection, a time to really begin to kind of undo and unbe and sort of learn who we are and, and try to begin unstitching that um, as a way to help create new conditions. And I thought that was. I, um, there are a number of things I remember. Um, I think first what I wanna say is that that impulse to recalibrate all of one's resources to racial justice and racial equity is one that um, I shared with, I'm very fortunate with my colleagues at the Cyprus uh, Art Department, and we Im immediately began meeting on a weekly basis to consider, uh, and the title we had, working title, Decentering Whiteness. How do we, we decenter whiteness? And we felt awkward because we didn't want to center whiteness by having it in the title, but we realized that that's what we needed to be doing. Um, and I, I saw with, um, you know, some delight that Dory had created this forum because 
I think, Dori, you and I come at the world in many ways from quite different directions. Um, but I always have respected what you do and difficult as I sometimes find it, um, I always learn from you. So, you know, when I get the opportunity, I come and learn from you. Um, and for me, you know, I'm very uh, cerebral, shall we say. I don't like body work. It bothers me for all kinds of reasons I'm not going to go into. But I know it's good for me. And um, the thing I really, really have brought away from that session and, and subsequent sessions that I attended is a feeling of utter disgust and repulsion of myself. Um, well, I, I have to say, I have a, you know, a healthy ego. It's not, a, it's not a harmful thing. It's a good thing. Because I thought I was somewhat woke. You know, I've been thinking about issues of my whiteness and its, its privilege for a while, largely illuminated by moving to America and understanding the, the immense privileges that that carried um, for me. Um, and it was this sense, oh my God, I thought I'd done all this work, but I still, right deep in my being are these assumptions and values, this kind of paradigmatic fishbowl we all swim in and we don't feel the currents, but we react and respond to them. And it was like coming in touch on a very visceral level with, with my whiteness, uh, as something that I still, like there's still so much work to do. So that, um, thank you, Doreen. Mm -hmm. I have a bunch of different thoughts running through my head. And, um, you know, the one of the reasons I was really excited to do the work was that um, I, I feel that I speak many different languages and many codes and understand how to code shift and situation shift and um, with a fair amount of ease. But I've never been the, the student who can do this, uh, a sentence diagram. They can tell you where the verb is and where, uh, um, and now, you know, I just, that's just not the way I work. I just speak or fumble my way through or feel my way through situations. And I knew that Dory had done the, the really good work of creating the structures and naming the structures. And that if I was going to step up to what I might be able to contribute at the time, I needed to up my game and, and diagram the sentence. And, um, and again, I'm speaking sort of in metaphors here about what, what it is Dory was bringing. Um, and I'll just maybe name a few things in that that have, um, I really saw, for example, um, how helpful the breakout sessions were and that there are people, and in some ways I'm one of them, who can do some of this important work in these smaller trusted groups, right? And that there are other people who get energy from sort of being in the bigger group, sort of performing their thinking out loud, their experiencing out loud. And that's a different people and at different times. Um, and that's just one example of way a structure and these were structured that, and, and then the sort of naming and then allowing the sort of the personal to come forward. Um, so I, I really valued that. And, you know, I'm, I'm using some of those tools in my classes at ASU with my students. You know, I, I think there's a trauma from Zoom right now. You know, there's a way it's fatiguing us. There's a way that it's distinguished us. There's a way that we can't see facial expressions and body language. And, um, and all of that is so necessary because this is subtle, complex stuff as we move around, as we unpack. I mean, it's not that, you know, it's not about oh, am I gonna take on that word racist? Am I a racist in my personal space? Or have I a, sort of been complicit knowingly or unknowingly with systems that are racist, that are supremacist, that do engage power structures? And so these kind of spaces that help unpack that, help name that, I think are beneficial for doing the work. 
and everybody's going to do the work in the ways they can. And the, I guess the last thing I'll say is that feeling like I didn't have the names for these things or the language around it, um, even though I moved fluidly through all kinds of spaces, was holding me back. It was holding me back and to, to, to show up. And so it, it helped, it's helping me show up. Yeah. Thank you, Dorit. Great. I mean, I, you know, an hour goes by quickly and we're not done, but we're, we're not gonna have the answers in this moment. And yeah. I think all of you referred to sort of the complexity of identity and you know, I was born and raised in Minneapolis. I was part of the heartland of this country. This is where I come from, straight, white, got two kids, I've got a dog, I've got, you know, a lot of privilege. And, and trying to begin to unpack that and something I love about your work, Dorit, and the People's Lab is thinking about transforming this into possibility you know, taking conflict, but this is, it's, it's very much an internal conflict, you know, mm -hmm. and it's one of these things I realized now many years ago, once something's revealed, you can't tuck it away. You know, once we see, we can't unsee. And so I think this moment's given us that it's, it's an uncomfortable place to be, which is fine. We know that all of our friends from you know, all of our black indigenous friends, people of color go through this on a daily basis. Um, and so it's an okay place to be white people. You know, part of that privilege is we don't spend time talking about race and it's somebody else's race. It's not about our own. And so um, I guess my question or my you know, what I'd like us to talk about a little bit is this unpacking and how you're sort of approaching that unpacking whiteness, because I know you, Dorit, in particular, don't identify necessarily as white. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it almost, um, and it's interesting because uh, across the sessions that, that where people have been, um, taking um, these, these labs um, that I've offered. Um, I, 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 there's been other participants who don't identify as white, um, but don't quite know how to identify because they are Iranian or Armenian or uh, biracial. Um, and there's no, you know, it, it's, 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 it's again, as I suggested earlier, it's part of the problem of how narrow are, uh, are, are we have categorically constructed identity and race being a part of it um, that is, is, is so narrow and so not who human beings are. Um, you know, it doesn't allow for, even for the imagination of co-liberation. It's, it, it's, 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 it's about protecting uh, uh, some people's privilege and it's not thought about anymore. And you know, and privilege is is not just money. Privileges, as I as I noted in my 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 small presentation, was a sense of I get to feel like I can confront another white person, whereas a person of color has to think twice, three times, a hundred times before they feel like it's safe to do that. And it's often not safe to do that. That is a privilege. Privilege. Is, is, is minutia, is minutia of daily details. That's the part that's hard to identify because it's not categorical. You're not gonna find it in the, the, the forms that we're asked to fill out. Are you this, are you this, are you this, are you this? It's not in any of those forms. We don't even have the language for it because we haven't been tweaked to imagine ourselves other than in those categories. And so it's, it's, that is part of our collusion. And that is part of the failure. You know, there, there, there's a, a brilliance to identity politics because it forces us to look at oppression in a categorical way. And at the same time, it's maintaining the categories and the narrowness of identity. 
So we're stuck. And if, if, if one, one, one of the, you know, the subtext of this inquiry is we need language. We need to, we need to be able to identify our, our emotional somatic experiences in more minutia of ways and then be able to describe them, be able to communicate them, turn them into language. So the end is not just in recognizing our somatic experience. That's a means towards an end. The end is actual communication with others, not just with yourself. But you know, to get there, we need to break down all of the ways that we've been socialized into categorical thinking. Uh, and that has destroyed language, emotion, recognition of experience, and relations. So, um, yeah, Gregory. Well, I would just add that it's long work, right? Yeah. It's, it's long work, yeah. and um, you know, and and if you're not accustomed to long work, then you know, and, and one of the um, I'll jump a little bit. One of the great things I heard recently uh, was a keynote by Angela Glover Blackwell. And she talked about um, walk into these situations, walk into these rooms with a racial analysis. And if you don't have a racial analysis, get one. Well, what does that, that, that caught my attention. And, um, and I was like, well, what does that, you know, what does that really mean? You know, and so some of the ways I've been going at that is thinking about what made me feel safe as a child, who has that, who doesn't have that, how has society in America been on this track for so many years that like taking away somebody's security of having a home, somebody's security of having a good education, somebody's security of having both parents, because one of those parents is in jail and why are they in jail? Right. Why? And so, I mean, there's so much there to begin to unpack as you move forward. Um, and, you know, one of the things I think that that sort of and, and I'm also often looking about where is where does our training as artists and art makers and image makers and cultural producers come into this? And I think about how things have shifted because of the cell phone, right? Because of the cell phone, because we've all become witness, citizen witnesses, right? And we now see all these images of what police are doing. And so that's opened up so much because of those video images. Well, now we know that the police said, oh, he came at me right? He came at me or whatever. And so they're shooting. Well, uh, that's not what the video says. And so we are now questioning that. But we have 40 years of a criminal justice system that has been built on that narrative. So that's only <coughs> in this moment do we have to make a shift. But we have to think about all of our assumptions that have constructed these social institutions that have done all these stratifications across race and class. There's a lot of work here. It's long work, and we only can do what we can do in the moment, right? We, can all, we have to be human. We have to take care of ourselves, and we have to take care of ourselves. This will wear us out, but we also have to be brave. We can't shy away from it. And... It's uncomfortable work in a big piece of it. And I love that Dorit is also always on this space about conflict, right? And it's, there's healthy tensions and how do tensions and conflicts push us into this next important piece of work uh, without these conflicts, without these horrible reveal movements, we would not be here. And it's good and it's important work and we need to be thankful for that, right alongside of being horrified. I think that's perfect, because what, what I was going to say I'll quickly, um, Kelly, you, you said, uh, once we see, we can't unsee. I actually think we can. I think, and I'm going to uh, offer a historical reference here to 9-11. And from a European point of view, it was yeah, there was this moment of rupture, this terrible rupture in American society. And we heard people saying, why do they hate us so much? Like there was this sudden kind of horror, horrific awareness of the American role in a global stage. 
and very very quickly within you know days there's an, an effort to comfort oneself and remove oneself from the rupture and I think that you know, for me, I'm very inspired by uh, Bawal's Theatre of the Oppressed. And the goal of Theatre of the Oppressed, uh, Bawal said, um, its purpose is to rehumanize humanity. And um, that uh, one of the, the key uh, tools of Theatre of the Oppressed, or the key, key goals, is to stay in the rupture, to resist that impulse to comfort oneself. And, and that's, you know, what tools that I'm trying to use. There's a lot. Um, there's a lot. I, I think about unpack, you know, how we begin to transform, you know, when we can see our own privilege, how do we start to transform that and open that up? And, and this sort of, I keep coming back to this real kind of mindset of scarcity that if some if we give some to others we won't have enough and and i think that's completely tied and bolstered into our own privilege um and i also have sort of hanging over me several posts i read from from people of color who i look up to who i greatly respect who soon after George Floyd said, I can't imagine what the world would look like without white supremacy. And, and now there's this uprise of this idea of radical imagining, which you know we're trying to take on here, but I'm seeing it over and over again. This is a moment we're living. It's an exciting moment. It's a scary moment. It's a, um, you know, I think it's a moment filled with the possibility of transformation, but the, the roadmap doesn't exist. Um, that's not a question. <laughs> I'll just add something on there. And I think that one of the things that art, artists do very well is prefiguration. You know, they kind of look into the future or they imagine the future and they start to establish those roadmaps. And so that's something uh, I, I think we can maybe be part of stepping up to. Absolutely. And there's also the roadmap absolutely doesn't exist but there are academics who've been studying uh, sorry that's <laughs> that's my role in the world academics who've been studying this for a while and they can give us again a kind of prefiguration of what some of the roads might be and i'd like to recommend an, a wonderful text um, called about racial equity detours by paul gorski um, and gorski describes how um, you know, this, as we've said here, um, defines racism as a tangled structural mess of power, oppression, and unjust just distributions of access and opportunity that can't be resolved just with greater cultural awareness, which is, of course, the direction so many academic institutions have been going in for the last couple of decades. So what's a racial equity diversion or detour or a red, as Gorski calls it? Well, things like in an institution, the institution will pace equity progress to prioritize the people who find it uncomfortable. And the people who find racial equity progress uncomfortable are usually quite influenced by ideas of white supremacy. So there's, you know, the progress doesn't happen. Um, it, it just kind of detours the funding for progress that might otherwise um, happen into a superficial rearranging of the deck chairs on the Titanic, for example. So that's just one. This is because it's the pacing for privilege detour. It's patterns over and over again, a roadmap to avoid. Um, so I, I strongly recommend that. That's one that we're using a lot in uh, my institution right now. It's great. Will you, Janet, just for the sake of, of both Nathan and Donna, repeat the title so they can post? Sure. Um, Racial Equity Detours by Paul Gorski. And I think it's available on his website. If not, I can, I think I can post the document in the chat. I don't think it's too big. Great. Dorit. 
can't hear you, dear. Sorry. Um, thank you, Janet, for, for that resource. Um, of all the resources that I've been using in, in, in um, the work I've been doing, um, the, one, the one book that keeps coming back and back and, and that people respond to very deeply is uh, My Grandmother's Hands um, by, um, what's his first name? Resma Menachem. Resma Menachem, um, who is um, actually a, a psychologist in Minneapolis um, uh, uh, a man of blackness who's worked for decades with um, uh, the black community and uh, working with trauma. And he writes this book with, with a deep openness to recognizing that trauma lives in all bodies, in white bodies as well, that the victimizer also carries trauma. And then that is in a really important hinge for us to recognize that um, the healing and the excavation needs to happen um, in, in, in all people, um, uh, not just in, 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 in one side of victim victimizer um, diagram. And he sets this out very, very clearly for both uh, for peoples of, of, of black and whiteness to, to work through trauma. The other thing I wanted to share in terms of roadmaps, I think there are many roadmaps and I think we need to shift our paradigm to plural rather than singular. And that the roadmaps that are now existing are coming up from local communities. They're coming up in many, many crevices. Um, just an example, um, two weeks ago, I was invited to uh, deliver or offer a people's lab session uh, for Caltech in uh, Pasadena um, on, on the question of, of racial justice and they have chosen to unpack their own archive because the archive of Caltech houses the infamous um, eugenics program of the 30s and 40s um, called the Human Betterment Foundation, which was spearheaded by the found, founding scientists of Caltech, which is at, at the heart and at the core of modern America. Um, and they're doing this, um, that's another roadmap. Go into your own archive. Going into your own archive as an institution is the same as the individual body going into your own trauma or, or to your own forgetting or into your own closed eyes and, and, and assimilation. Um, it, it's an excavation paradigm. It's, it's an archeological paradigm of, of unpack, look back, dig in. You know, don't just try to jump forward with um, ideas that, that are old, stop and, and spend the time to dig in and to unpack and to reassess, to relook, to rename, and then move to create new paradigms with which to move forward. So there are many, as I said, there's many roadmaps, I think. The roadmaps are in history. The histories that we may not yet know. Thank you all. I want to see if we have questions. That's hi, Donna. Hi. How are you? I'm good. I want to thank you all for sharing your important work and perspectives, and you know, crucially for being willing to go into this kind of uncomfortable and vulnerable space and have this conversation today. Um, we really need to do more of this to really push ourselves into the kind of growth mode that we need. Um, you've been talking about the importance of taking this moment for deep reflection um, and exploration of privilege. And we have a comment from Philip Finn, who um, says, we aren't going to have the answers, but we are starting to ask the questions. And I thought that was um, you know, very resonant for what you've been talking about. Um, I also want to thank you for sharing the resources with us, the kind of roadmap ideas. Um, I'd love to kind of ask you a question and dig into um, an idea of ways we can think about transforming and giving up our privilege and how, how do we yield access to power? I'm think, thinking about this very much when, you know, Kelly and I are considering the platforms of 
access and authority and power we have at the Lucas Artist Program. And that includes, um, you know, exhibition making and public programming and how we give up and share power in those sorts of processes. And also thinking about the communities the Lucas Artist Residency Program holds space for and how those communities are constituted and if there are more equitable models that we can kind of start considering. So I'd love to hear your thoughts about yielding access to power and, um, and also I'd love to hear your thoughts um, in this spirit of like reimagining about what role the residency could play in this equity work in your mind. They're all on mute, Donna. <laughs> Anyone want to take that on? <laughs> Jan and Gregory, you've been residents at the residency, so. Um, I know that the two of you have done a lot of work in this regard in diversifying, um, you know, the artists who come, the subjects they focus on. But um, I, I'm going to go back to Paul Gorski, and he says this mess cannot be resolved with greater cultural awareness alone. Just like, you know, when I'm thinking about my art history syllabuses, just widening the canon and including more artists of color or women or LGBTQ. Of course, I need, I do that. I need to do that. But that's absolutely not enough. We have to identify the source of the, of the constriction on our imagination. We have to understand. And, you know, that's why I started off with that beautiful painting. We have to understand how these ideas are so seductive to us as white people. You know, we have been fed these lies coated in sugar for generations. I mean, quite literally coated in sugar, if you think about sugar production and the slave trade. Um, so we need to address the question head on, as you are doing here. And... I, you know, I, far be it from me to suggest ways for you to do something that I know you're expert at, but, you know, continuing this, having, you know, s multiple conversations that dig into these, these questions, um, I think is, is what we we're, we're all need to be doing. And, and acting, you know, avoiding the racial equity diversions, <laughs> staying in the rupture. I would say structurally, um, I would like to see all institutions slow down. Mm. You don't, I really don't think we need as much programming as happens. It is so overwhelming and um, so few people get to see, nobody gets to see everything. You know, and um, uh, I, I've stopped chasing because it's just exhausting. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I ask myself, you know, what more information do I need? Do I want? I just, rather than I want to sit with that one thing or that one image or that one gesture or that one, you know, sound. And, and I, I, want, I want to slow down. I want to be asked a minutia of questions of how am I experiencing this? And, 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 and what does it make me wonder? I, I, want, I, want to, I, want, I want new ideas to be teased out of me along next to others who are thinking differently than I am. So I don't just want to be a passive consumer. I'm, I'm more tired of passively consuming, more aware of my passivity as a consumer in, in the cultural realm, as an artist, as a maker, um, and you know, as someone who believes in, in, in cultural production. I, I think the way we're doing it is, um, is about consumption, mm -hmm. is about how many programs can we get out of this budget? you know, and like, um, so that we can make sure we get twice the budget next time to do twice as much. Like, why? Who's it for? Mm. 
rather than working with the material and the content of whatever it is you're producing and opening it up, spreading it open, creating more horizontality of, 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 of places to in, uh, enter into it, to question, to pull out tools, to, to create new paradigms from this new thing. That's what I want to see cultural institutions doing. I want to spend just a moment interrogating the notion of giving up. And I just want to invite us to kind of um, ease off of that a little bit. Uh, that I think that that, is, I, I think it's true, mm -hmm. right? I think there's some truth there, but I also think it's one of the things that is sort of a little bit of a trigger in different kinds of ways. Um, you know, in that, uh, I was talking about that, that moment at the beginning with Sheriff Jarpayo recognizing that I was, that we had both had family from the Shenandoah Valley. Um, what he was doing in that moment was he was putting, he decided he was gonna like me. And so, because we both had family from this, this, this part of the Appalachia and that, um, and that was a white privilege thing, right? But how could I use my white privilege to elbow my way into that space and then open that space so that we could have something broader? But it wasn't just about doing that because it was also incredibly uncertain. He's, he's you know, notorious for hijacking situations and for throwing people under the bus, right? And for my institution, right? In, in my university where the muse, where the, and, project was at the museum. I mean, it, it was, there was lots of uncertainty. And, and that's the thing I think Montavo has actually already been doing. Because I got to be there so much when you come back uh, for a month every three years and different times, I witnessed things. I witnessed when the police kept stopping some of the uh, folk who worked at Montavo, who were people of color, and you know, you and the, got together and built those relationships. And the director called the local sheriff and had them come up and say, "Hey, what's going on here?" You know, and 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 that wasn't just allowing that, but that as a staff, all the way up to the top those difficult things and in the institution to institution discussion happened. And that played out in these amazing ways with Jennifer, uh, Jennifer's performance and things like that. Um, and also interrogating the history of, of Montalvo. It's got a dicey history, right? You have somebody who, who's your main sort of namesake benefactor who did this, some amazing work and also some really, hmm, questionable things uh, <laughs> around, you know, uh, things. And you've been willing to move into those uncertain spaces. Um, some people were on the conversation early and we were talking a little bit about the Karen Finley and Bruce Yanamoto film around his history and the different ways that you've been willing to walk in. So I think there's important work to do and yes, Yes, but maybe uh, let's expand out past giving up as a concept. And um, um. thank you, Gregory. Yeah, I want to thank you all. I think we might have hit our time. And Donna, thank you for your questions. Thank you for being here. Dorit, everything you said is written down and slow down, spread out. Dig deeper. I appreciate you guys all. It's the wrong way to say it. I appreciate y'all taking this time with me because this is a conversation that I felt was really important. Can't thank you enough, Dorit, for being here and Janet and Gregory for your, your willingness to share and kind of be brave with me in this moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you to the audience. Yes, thank you for listening. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. So, Donna, do you want to tell us a little bit about next week's stretch? Oh, yes. Um, so, um, absolutely. I'm very excited about next week. We're going to be joined by Maria Hopfield, and, uh, who's a visual artist, and poet Natalie Diaz. Um, and they're gonna be discussing how we can reimagine our borderlands as fluid and return to the practice of migration as a natural relationship 
with language, story, land and water and one another. Um, we'll also explore Hupfield's exhibition, uh, Nine Years Towards the Sun, that's uh, currently on at the Heard Museum. And um, Natalie Diaz will also be sharing and reading work from her latest poetry collection called uh, Postcolonial Love Poem. So that should be good. And I'm excited. So please join us next week. Thank you all. I can't tell you how grateful I am. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.